you know, I understand you had a pretty bad former life. Yeah, at the age of 17, I'm fully hooked to heroin on a methadone script at 18, in and out of prison. What was different about the last time you quit? It's got to be within you. Something just switches in you. A bit like you, three years down the line in recovery, you pinch yourself from where you were. Well, I started 50 grand in debt and I've got one property that's probably worth half of Peterborough. <laughs> Well, I must introduce him. His name is Rob Moore. How are you, Rob? All good in the hood, my friend. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Can you give me a bit of a backstory of, of, of why you are so disruptive? Well, I just never fit in. I couldn't fit in in anything. Um, I just couldn't. I don't know why. And I always tried. I always tried to get good grades, be a good boy, do what I'm told. But you know, I'm taller than most people, I'm louder than most people. Anywhere I've ever gone, I just always was the guy that stuck out for the right or wrong reasons. So it's not like I'm disruptive because I'm Uber or Airbnb, you know, or I'm a billion dollar unicorn. That's, that's one definition of disruptive or disruptor. For me, it's just didn't fit in, did the opposite to everyone else, what I liked, no one else liked, and what everyone else liked, I didn't like. And I always felt like a bit of an outsider. And for probably 27 years of my life, I always tried to get on the inside and to fit in and have people like me and have people accept me and have people appreciate me. And I either didn't get that, and so it felt empty, or when I did get it, I felt like a bit of a or I think you have to say sex worker now so you don't get cancelled. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, I felt yeah. like an emotional sex worker where I'd sold myself out pretending to be someone else. So becoming an entrepreneur age 27, um, Callum, was the best thing for me in my whole life, obviously other than my wife and kids, because I could express myself and be myself and be rebellious mm. and be disruptive and not get ostracised or kicked out or fired. In fact, the more disruptive I was, the more money I would make. So... Mm. I guess misfits, rebe you know, rebels, disruptors, kids that were naughty at school. There's hope for all of us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, um, I, I say it all the time. I have to be careful when I do it, but, you know, maybe I'll beat your record one day at public speaking. I've been doing a lot of public speaking recently, um, um, some with the police force as well. And one of the things I try and do is, 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 is paint that picture that it's never too late to change. Um, there is hope after, you know, whatever your trauma may be, whether it's addiction, whether it's crime, what, what, whatever it is. Um, but you've got to be careful. I, in my sense, it's like you've just got to be careful of not promoting that, you know. For, of course, to be an entrepreneur, you know, promoted to the hills, but... Whenever I kind of say, it's never too late, you can do whatever you want. I don't really want someone thinking, okay, so I can go and kill someone and I can still come out of jail and be this, you know, I'm trying not to promote the bad in it. It's, it's a very fine line, I feel, which is quite hard to um, kind of promote sometimes. But why was it then, at 27, you, you decided to break free from, you could say, being a normal person to becoming an entrepreneur because the way you describe it it's as if it is like coming out as being gay or something it's like you are being free from some i become an entrepreneur and my life changed like what why is that yeah um there's two things in there i think to answer but actually if it's all right um i want to throw it back at you okay. um because we come from different worlds and you know this is why i love doing these kind of conversations and yeah. in, in my world, you're kind of weird if you're not an entrepreneur. But in your world, I think it's the opposite, where you're kind of weird if you are. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting you said you want to be careful about promoting you can be and do anything and it's never too late in case people do the wrong things. But I would challenge you on that because, you know, I don't think maybe we'd be doing this if you didn't have that amazing story of overcoming addiction. Yeah. And I would also say that sometimes people try and be careful about how they put themselves out in the world because they're scared about what people will think about them. And so actually what they're doing is holding back who they really are. So have you got any thoughts on that? And can you, um, can you just put my listeners in the picture? Because, you know, I understand you had a pretty bad <laughs> former life before you're a yeah. co podcast legend. For the people who are listening, yeah, I'm from Cardiff and I, um, I spent 
all my adult life really. It's only been the last two years that I'm in recovery. And this is the longest time I've been in recovery. I've tried many times, but um, yeah, at the age of 17, I got into uh, ad ad addiction really. Started off with cannabis and within a year, I'm, I'm fully hooked to heroin on a methadone script at 18. And uh, yeah, just living a chaotic life in and out of prison. Um, getting up to all sorts, Rob, really. And um, I really ripped my life off. I never, ever thought that I would have a conversation like this. I never even thought I'd ever have my family accept me back into life. Everything I would say to my family, it doesn't matter what it was, it was a lie to them. Anything that come out of my mouth, they just, they just shrug it off. They just didn't believe me. And to even have a conversation with my father, a simple one like, what are you doing tomorrow? And me being able to tell him what I'm doing tomorrow and for him to believe me, is like, I never thought I'd ever have that. That's how bad it was. So yeah, that's that's where I am in life. That's where I was in my life, where I am now. I am, I am now um, coming up to three years clean. Um, I'm obviously the host and founder of the Central Club, which is it's tough coming out of Cardiff as a podcaster. You know, it's, <laughs> I think you get better opportunities in London. But <laughs> at the same time, I do say that we do get good pickings because some of the Welsh legends that we we have had is is being because we're Welsh, you know? So, but then you look at someone like James English, who's a jock and, and, and he's doing really well, you know? So, um, I, I, you know, we've got the central club, which is starting to take off. And, and then we, you know, I'm a full-time drug worker as well. So I'm out, I'm literally still out in the, in the community, in the trenches, I like to say, you know, um, I want to keep myself grounded. I think a lot of people who are in addiction, People who come out of addiction, and, and when I say addiction, I'm talking specifically heroin, opioids, um, because there's many alcoholics out there who turn their lives around, and I really appreciate that, and I champion that. Opioids is, is a different story, a different kettle of fish, and it's very hard, very rare that you get success stories out of it. So when you get people who do come out that other side, for them to come out and be open about it is, is, is a rarity. I know countless people who have come through the other side and, and don't want to mend, they want to forget about that life. They're married now and they, their wives don't even know that they were once addicted to hardcore drugs. They want to leave that life behind. I suppose when you're working full time in Domino's for 20 years, you don't really want to go and sit in Domino's on your break time. And it's a similar thing with um, addiction. You, you want to leave that life behind. So when you find someone who wants to stay in that life, and, and, and share their stories as honest as possible and also try and help guide others. It's a rarity. So I have been really successful in my job. I've climbed up and it's, I love doing it. I really, really love doing what I do and I want to keep doing that. I want to hopefully one day incorporate the Central Club with, with what I do, um, but finding that kind of formula has been quite tough at the moment. Can I ask you one question on that then? Um what was different about the last time you quit to all the other times you quit? Because you're three years in recovery, so let's say that's the successful quit, but you probably tried to quit 50 other times. Yeah. What's different this time? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's got to be within you, you know? Something just switches in you. Um, because I give my, I give other things too much credit. It's me. I changed, but there has been there's, there's like an element of things the same as there was an element of things why I got into addiction. It wasn't just one thing. There was a, a, a you know a handful of things that led me to that that point of heroin addiction. So what happened with me was, um, you know, my mum and dad they. They really tried everything for me. Um, you know, they took me to rehab. They took me on holiday. They took me to uh, Kettering Town near Peterborough, where, where, where you live, where my family are from. My family are from Corby. Um, and, you know, I, I lived up there trying to do heroin deto uh, detoxes, all that type of stuff. And none of it ever worked. I didn't really want to do it. I was doing it for them. What happened this time... Um, my best friend, a close friend of mine, really, my co-defendant, he passed away. And the very same day he passed away, I was rushed to hospital and I almost died. Um, this was during lockdown 2020. This is probably some people's worst year. It ended up being the best year of my life. When I woke up in hospital a couple of days later, I just knew in my heart, heart it was my time to change. I had a tag brace on. 
um, I was, I had a court date looming over me and I was definitely going to prison. And I just thought, I can't do this no more. I was up on the respiratory ward in uh, he South Wales Hospital, Heath Hospital. And everyone around me was like 70 plus, all old men, old women. And I was 29, you know, young lad. And the doctor come up to me and said, your insides are worse than any of these here. You will die if you if you leave this hospital and carry on. And at the time I couldn't leave. I, it, it, I think I was bedridden for like two, three weeks before I could even get out of bed. Um, and I was on a methadone script and I was on a high dose of methadone. I was on 90 mils. Because um, when I got rushed in um, and they knew I was, you know, using on top of my meth and all this stuff, the doctors from my, my, my drug clinic said to me, you can stay on a methadone script, but you're going to have to pick your meth up every single day, including weekends, or you have this other option. And they said, you will be one of the first people in Britain to try this. You, you will be a guinea pig, really. Um, and that is if you would take the option two, which is Bouvardal. And I looked at him and I was like, Bouvardal, what are you, what the fuck is this like, you know? Um, um, and, and obviously, I, I, like I said, I had this, this bargain with myself whilst I was in there that, you know, I really want to change. Please, God, give me this opportunity and I will turn my life around. Um, so when that guy came in and said, you can go back on your meth, I knew if I, if I took that option, I, I was contradicting everything I was saying. So I tried option two, which I thought would just, you know, after the week I'd be back on heroin. I genuinely thought it wouldn't work. And for, for, for your people who don't know, Bouvardal is basically an injection that you put in your muscle, uh, which blocks opiates um, for a month. I, I, if I could live a life with no medication, I would, you know, but I think people need to realize the lesser of the two evils. Three years ago, I was robbing everything. You couldn't have something pinned down. I was up and down the country, shoplifting really bad, uh, robbing off people. I was taking two, three hundred pounds worth a day of heroin and crack. Um, you know, I wasn't a nice person. And now, you know, I'm full time. I'm settled down with, with, with a beautiful, beautiful partner. You know, I've got my family back, got friends back. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I am somewhat ambitious and, you know, I want to do something with my life. So, you know, Bouvardal has changed my life massively. What a story. Um, I think there's something similar to be talked about with starting your own business or being an entrepreneur. And I had a bit of an ulterior motive for asking the question because I wanted to find the trigger that finally got you to make the decision to change and not go back. Um, and I know people who've tried to start a business and failed or wanted to quit their job because they don't like their boss or they're working a lot of hours and they're paying a load of tax, but something always stops them. Uh, and you had however many years of trauma and pain. I know people in their 30s and 40s and 50s who start their business thinking it's too late. So um, I started when I was 27 because from the age of six, I was raised by an entrepreneur. But many people don't know where to start or what to do. They just know that there's something else that they want. Whereas it was the opposite from me. I, my dad was the, he was like Americans call people hustlers, you know, these people who hustle and grind. Well, I mean, my dad was the quintessential hustler. Um, and he could always, he was especially good when he got himself in a bit of trouble or it was hard or he got into a bit of debt. He could always pull himself out of a hole. And I saw that. I, in fact, he got me working age six in his pubs, bottling up and then doing the bar and then doing the restaurant all the way through till age 18. I preferred that to going to school. But then, oh, but Rob, you've got to get a job and you've got to get careers advice and you've got to go to university. And, you know, if you, if you want to get a job, you've got to get a degree. And this was friends, family, not my dad, society, all in my ear with all of this. So I went down that road and age 26.9, I was 50 grand in debt, had three crap jobs I couldn't hold down. Um, and I kind of lost who I was. And so you asked me before I threw it back at you, but the reason I got into starting my own business was because 
I'd always wanted to, but the system and the school system and society and what the do-gooders tell you you should do had trapped me for yeah. seven or eight years. It's very similar, isn't it? Like, you know, um, that, that, you know, is it too late? Is it too late? Is it not? It is very similar, entrepreneur and addiction, I suppose, because, you know, even now, two, three years, I am confident that I could be some sort of entrepreneur, you know, which is something I never would have thought before. And it's funny we talk about that now because I've just had a property revalued that I own um, for 21.46 million. It's gone up to about 2 million in the last 12 months. And that same property makes me £700,000 profit per year. So wow. a bit like you, three years down the line in recovery, you pinch yourself from where you were. Well, I started 50 grand in debt and I've got one property that's well, th- probably yeah, worth half of gonna... Peterborough. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm going to see. It's all about that leap of faith, isn't it? And just how, how, what's going through your mind when you are in 60 grand worth of debt to go into a property investment like, you know, because anyone in their right mind who is down that much money, whether, whether we see it physically or it's in, you know, debts we have to pay off and we can kind of fob off for a bit. How can you take that leap of faith? What's going through your mind? Well, I mean, there's different ways to look at this, but if you think about it, every new day is a leap of faith, isn't it? Because we don't know what's coming tomorrow. So um, every day is a new opportunity to try something. Every day is Mm -hmm. a new day to get out of your comfort zone. And if you fail or make a mistake, then the day after that is a day to get back on the horse and try again. So I think what happened was I got 50 grand in debt. I was really close to going personally bankrupt. So I probably, if I'm honest, felt like I didn't have much to lose anymore. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that can actually be good because if you're comfortable, you've got stuff to lose. And I, some of the people that I help, they're quite successful already. You know, they've got a, a 75 grand a year job. They've got a nice car. They've got a decent house. They've got a mortgage. They've got a kid or two. And actually for them, it's quite hard because they've got a lot to lose. So um, I didn't have much to lose, but then things were really bad. Maybe like, you know, you three years ago. So um, I just think that we underestimate as humans what we're capable of. And I think if anyone wants anything bad enough, they can achieve it. And if they're motivated enough, they'll work hard enough for it. And if the consequences of um, failure or non-success are big enough, then it is a given that they will be successful. You know, there's a couple of the things I want to quickly fly through. Investable qualities. It's a video I've watched a few times off you. Can you go through the investable qualities? Yeah, so um, people think you need money to invest. Um, Whilst money makes money, money is one of the slowest ways to make money. So there are much quicker ways to make money. Number one, you have a disruptive or valuable product or service. So an investable quality in someone is coming up with a good idea, number one. Um, Number two would be your ethic. So if you get up earlier and finish later than the average nine to fiver, you immediately position yourself as someone who is worth investing in. So you've got idea, you've got ethic, um, then you've got your network. So um, I know a lot of people who know a lot of people. And I also know a lot of people who, the way they make their living is by connecting people together. So you might have friends and family or extended network of people who like, for example, I've interviewed a lot of billionaires on my podcast. Um, So your ability to connect people. The next one would be your ability to build relationships with people. Um, I always use this example in my property seminars. I say, let's say you've got 100 grand, let's play this game. You've got 100 grand and you're going to invest it in someone. But it's, you know, it's your only 100 grand, so you need this to work. Do you pick A, the person who's super credible, done loads of deals, clearly made money, but you don't trust them and you don't like them. Or B, the person who's a beginner, not really got any credibility, but you believe in them, you trust them, there's something about them and you'd back them and you like them. Which one do you pick? 
Most people, 90, 95% of people, pick the person with um, no experience, but likeable, credible. So people think you need a load of experience, but experience with someone who is arrogant or mm. cold um, or transactional actually doesn't make them that investable. Whereas someone who might not have a lot of experience but has got that relationship building quality, um, I've seen it time and time again. Because if you think about it, every winner was once a beginner, every master was once a disaster. And anyone who's borrowed millions, they had to borrow their first 10 grand. You know, I've raised hundreds of millions for property deals. Um, and I raised my first 30 grand off my business partner, Mark Homer, in 2006. And I was still in debt. So he clearly didn't look at me and go, yeah, Rob's made loads of money. Rob's got loads of credibility. He looked at me and went, Rob's a hustler. Um, Rob works harder than most. Rob's pretty good at building relationships. You know, I, I believe him. Uh, I trust him. And, and these are investable qualities a lot of people don't talk about. Hey, Rob, honestly, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been a pleasure. We'll definitely hook up again. So make sure you do like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.